my my sister, well, my friend, my sister, I've known her for, forever. And um, I met her when she was the manager, corporate manager of um, Virgin Atlantic. Inkeru, can you, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, because your, your network is um, like it's rolling. Really? Okay, the topic. Okay, can you please pin the topic? Yeah, the topic is uh, we're going to be talking about rape culture. Rape culture, feminism, the girl child, and empowering women. And um, we're also going to, uh, we're also going to call mentorship because the Kiru is good at mentoring young ladies, you know, helping them to carve their way, their career. And we're also going to talk about writing. Well, because Kiru is a writer, she's an author. She, she did, I mean, she uh, published a book about, uh, called The Pressure Cooker. So uh, we're going to talk about everything that has to do with women today. Most especially mentorship. Because that's what Kim, one of the Kim's passion. She loves to mentor young women and um, like try to guide them to the right path. Kim, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very well. But okay, I can see you're... from another phone that okay, because I, I look because funny. You're... So I'm going to get up, sign you. off and join up. I Azuka, I've just requested just using rolling, another phone. Rolling, you're not moving. You're just still. Okay. She's going to join me back again because she's not. Um, she's not. She's not. She's not. She's not. She's, not, she's just rolling. Uh, camera is just still. Okay. Thank you guys for joining. Thank you so much for joining. Just be patient with us. You know, network Wahala is just something else. And then um, we need to, okay, Kiri is back again. For these things. Hello, I can see pilots. XT boy. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Nehita. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Oremi. Rita, thank you. There's nothing as good as having supportive friends who love you genuinely. Pilot, I'm Haley No. <laughs> Chinwa, I see you. Thank you for joining. Um, Inkiru is going to join us soon. She's trying to, I think she's trying to fix her camera. Thank you guys for joining. I really appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Success. I can see you. Suk Suk. Doki. I can see you all. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Um, it's going to be a very beautiful evening. We all know that um, for the past two days, or oh, since on Tuesday, when I think I saw it for some Tiwa Sabbath. Ozi, I can see you. Ozi, I can see you. Thanks for joining. I think I saw that on Tiwa Savage's page where she was, um, th there's this, um, um, she had this post um, talking about Black Tuesday. Okay, Kiri's back. I had that now. Thank you, thank you. Egmont Toby, I can see you. <laughs> Forgotten an email, sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you so much. Inkiru, can you? I, don't know I can, I'm not sure what's wrong with my phone, so. I just be trying. It happens like that sometimes. I'm just, I'm waiting for you. Just be trying. Because even before I came on live right now, I've been off and on and trying to sort it out. Just keep trying. Yes. Okay, so I think I'm... Give me that one. Yeah. Okay. Can you see me? Yes, I can see you now very well. Welcome Okay, back. excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Azuka. And hello, everyone. Let's get going. <laughs> well, I wanted you to come back. So I stopped talking about you. I was trying to tell them... How long I've known you for? Yes. 
that I met you when you were the um, corporate manager of Virgin Atlantic. That was, that was, that was a big one then. That was a big one. Then before Ekiruna moved to Virgin Nigeria, we still were still friends. We didn't stop together because I write for these daily papers. So a lot of times her briefs come to my desk. So that's how we became friends. And um, one time she took me on this trip. We, we traveled all the way from, uh, they were launching their flights from Lagos, to Nigeria to Liberia. Yeah. So we went to Liberia. That was my first time of doing a trip out of Nigeria. Same day and coming back that same day. So we, I mean, we got, we, I mean, we became close and for we were friends for, forever, I guess. So Kira has been very supportive and, and I'm very proud of her. She's done so well in the corporate sector from Virgin Atlantic. I think she went to one of the telecom company then. Yes, Etel. Was it Etel? It was Etel, yes. Etel, yeah. She went yes. to Etel, headed the corporate department, first of all, went to the banking sector. And right now, Sean Kiro, I need to read your position. They need to know that I'm not talking to a small fish. Show. Let me read you. I'm going to I'm going to say it. Because I'm going to read my poster. They just they didn't read what I wrote about you. So I'm going to read about Inkiri to you guys so that you guys will know that we have fantastic women doing so well outside the country. Okay, now I'm going to for for for, for you guys who didn't who don't follow me on my personal page and didn't see what I wrote, I wrote about Inkiru. In Kiru, okay, I won't, okay, let me just go to where she's right now. She's in South Africa. Um, she's um, she's the head. She she used to be the form. Okay, she used to be the former executive executive head of marketing and communication of Stambik IBTC Bank, a subsidiary of Standard uh, Standard Bank Group in Nigeria. In Kiru was elevated by the group to coordinate this marketing and communication activities in South Africa and Central Africa. Oh, more you guys should clap for my friend. It's not easy. Not me beans. Not me beans. So, so Kira has always made us proud. I mean, we all that know her very well. She's always made us proud, and um, she's also very close to God. She's a she's a godly woman, and her passion is not she's not doing for for anything. She just loves to mentor young ladies, like guide them to the right path, and that was why she, I think she part of the reason she wrote a book called the Pressure Cooker. So Nkiru, let's start with Pressure Cooker. For those of, for, for those people who haven't, who haven't read the book, let's start with Pressure Why did you even write about that book? Okay, so hello everyone and, and Zuki, thank you so much for having me. You've told them the story of how we've known for, for many years. And, and I think what you haven't told them is that we always bounce off ideas of each other and call each other at critical moments or trying to check something or really just to get each other's opinion, you know, now and again. And I think that's what um, good quality relationships are about. So thank you for having me. And I can see a few of, of my relatives from Stambika, BTC, Mommy Chizi, um, Toas, just a lot of people. So hello, everyone. I'm looking forward to a very valuable conversation. So, I mean, the reason I wrote Pressure Cooker was out of my own personal struggle. I had been struggling, you know, as a wife, mom, trying to balance everything, trying to be a good wife, a good mom, a good worker, a good mm -hmm. sister, you know. And I was struggling so much, and many bottles were, were dropping. And, and I just thought, you know what, this is so frustrating. Can I just vent? So it was actually started as a column where I was venting. Yeah. And after venting for many years and getting great responses, I thought, okay, hey, we can actually, we can actually turn this into a book. And that's how the book was born. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... I know also that you also you have a, you have a column too that you write. I think it's Business Day, and um, you used to write the columns. I just moved it to this day, this day style. It was called the Pressure Cooker. Now it's called the Working Girl. Okay, Working Girl. Yes. Okay, yes. Um, Kiru. I know that you invited me to a couple of things you've done. I remember. I think um, um, it's called. Um, Guiding the lighthouse. I think the lighthouse, yeah. Yes. I, and lighthouse my friend, I was very inspired because um, the speakers were very. Diff I mean, even one of them was my very good friend, Lion da Silva. I was very inspired at the way you picked your speakers, not because you felt somebody was popular, because you, you followed their history and you know that this woman has something to say. 
So tell us about the, the I want us, I mean, talk about that. I want us to talk about it and why you think a lot of women should also attend the next one when it happens. Mm. Okay, I mean, it's the one thing that I was clear about is that sorry I don't have. The, sorry to cut you. I used to think that it was a church program, though. I used to think it was a church mm. program. Maybe um, <laughs> the church organizes it and you're like the head of it. So I need to find out today what it's actually all about. You are not, not the only one. I had Hadiza Bala Usman come to speak, I don't know, maybe four years ago. And yeah. she said when she got it, she thought this must be a church. But it doesn't look like a church. Look, the principle, <laughs> is, the principle is faith-based, which is that as women, we can light. Mm -hmm. And we can light up our community, light up the workplace. And we can pass on buttons of light to the other yeah. women so that everywhere... Yeah will shine um, really bright. So that was a principle. And I mean, I think the second thing is I was clear that I didn't have all the answers and there was no way I could have all the answers. So I thought if I brought women, you know, together, then we can find different answers and we could go away with the pot periods of wisdom mm. from different people. Um, so that's how we started. We've had several speakers. Um, I mean, when we started, we had... Um, Diola Sego, can't believe she indulged me because I know yeah. she can be quite private. We've had Diola Sego, we've had, we've had tons of speakers. We've had Mo, we've had Mrs. Tomi Shomefu, MD of Unity Bank. We've had very recently Mrs. Maria Mouez, Mrs. Shola David Boha, just women that you can also account for their, for their integrity. Yeah. So, um, what has been your, 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 your driving force as a woman? Like, I mean, I, I, every time I heard about you. you're not even just going there you're going up up what has been your your your, your, your driving force mm. look i think when we were young we were because, um, because i know you're ambitious but but it's not it's, you're not thirsty i mean like you're you're ambitious you're an ambitious woman but you're not thirsty it's not like it's on your face you're not um you're not you're not punching my face with your with with what you want to be or how far you want to go in life it's just so true mm -hmm. So how do you, how you they gather yourself together? How you they, I mean, how you they drum? <laughs> how they use pack, how they use pack myself, they move forward. How you they pack yourself, they go. Those, they're just going higher and higher and Jesus might me. So we need Amen. to know. Amen. And, and, and thank you for the kind comments. I mean, first of all, I'm still on a journey. I'm not anywhere near all of the many places that I want to go to. I think second of all, growing up, we were three girls in my household and we kind of felt like, people felt, oh, three girls. So I thought I'm going to be a lot of things and I'm going to show them that being a girl is not a deterrent from achieving anything you want to be. And I've kind of had that mindset. And to be honest, I've never felt like if there was a way to feel like a girl, I've never felt like a girl. I've always just carried on with what needed to, to be done. And, and I hear you about, about ambition and and you know, being tested for ambition. I think that when you are purposeful, you know, in whatever your ambition is, mm -hmm. I think that ambition, and I heard one of my mentors say that ambition that is about impact is more um, obviously impactful than ambition that is selfish, which is all about me. Mm -hmm. mm. Okay, now... Um... With, I know that you've always mentored young girls. Why, I mean, like, why, why are you not being selfish with, with how far God has pushed you? Why do you think you don't have a girl, you don't have a, you don't have a daughter, you don't have a girl child? Why do you think, and you're not even a politician. You're not a politician, you're not, um, so why do you think, why are you, why are you finding time to do that? Because hmm. a lot of times when people do this, it's because either they are, they are in politics hmm. or they are doing one NGO that you cannot really um, like match it together, what mm -hmm. their aims are. So mm -hmm. in your case, how do you, and you're, you're, you're married, you have two boys, you're, you're married to a fantastic, a, a lovely man, I know that. You, are, you, are, you, are, you, are, you have two lovely sons, you are busy. You are busy and like you're really busy. So how do you still find time for other people's children? <laughs> like mentoring them. Yeah. Look, I think it's because I struggled. And mm -hmm. when I 
struggled in the course of my career at different levels, I felt like a lot of the errors that I made, if I had an older woman that said, hey, Nkiru, come and sit down here. That's not how to talk in the meetings. Come and sit down here. You can't keep giving everyone a piece of your mind. Come and sit down here. That's not the way you show up. Come and sit down here. So I kind of felt if I had someone who would guide me or who would have guided me and held me, I wouldn't have made as much errors that I made. So it kind of became a passion. I remember in years Kiru, ago. Kiru, Kiru, hold on. You made errors. What kind of errors did you make? So, I mean, I would, I mean, I grew up in Port Harcourt. My mom is Igbo. My dad is Edo. I mean, I don't think that it comes any more upfront. Mm-hmm. And, and I know that in the corporates, you've got to be a bit sensitive in the way that you said things, in the way that you pitched things. Mm-hmm. And look, you can be making a presentation and I will say, ah, uh-uh. how can you say two plus two is five? Well, that's wrong now. Didn't you pass jam? Yeah. Whereas the appropriate way to say it is, thank you so much for putting together that presentation. I thought it was good. Would you want to have a look at your numbers? Your numbers look a bit, maybe you want to have a second look at it. So, and I would say those things and I would see people like shocked, like, yo, who said that? And I mean, I thought that if an older woman had said, ah, come here, come here. That's not how they say those things. And if someone has said to me that, um, it's not enough to just have skills. You also need emotional intelligence. Yeah. I think that, I mean, I say so often, but I guess God knows in the end, but I feel like I could have gotten higher and faster in my career if I had all, all of that guidance. So I thought I'm not going to let the other woman make, make mm-hmm. that error. And I remember once a young, beautiful girl came to interview. And, you know, she just sat at the interview referring to herself in the third party, not very passionate. And, you know, when she left the interview, she just looked like a, just a pretty eye candy. And I was so upset. Obviously, she didn't get the role. And months later, after the person who got the role had been given the role, I called her. And I said, come here, my dear. You came to interview. And you were giving examples about yourself in the third person. Mm. Then you were talking without passion. Then you had a Rapunzel hair that was sweeping the floor. I said, you didn't pitch yourself correctly. And and she didn't know. She said, hey, I didn't. Hey, what should I have done? And it occurred to me that not a lot of people actually know, you know, what we consider little things. So I thought if my role is to get people to understand how you show up, how you navigate the workplace, just help people deliver and develop the EQ that I, I didn't have when I was growing um, in, in, my, in the workforce. I think that, I mean, I would have lit up somebody's life in a and so and in the lighthouse. Okay, um, fine. Fantastic one. Um, now, I'm getting a bit confused about this word feminism. Feminism. Mm. Mm. So, first of all, I'm going to ask you, are you a feminist? <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to answer without defining what feminism means to me. Yes. Yeah. And, and I think it's important because for a long time, even though that was, I was into pers- and female personal development, I couldn't mm-hmm. confidently scream about feminism. Look, feminism simply means equity. It simply means that what is good for the geese is good for the gander. Whether it be payroll, whether it be political rights, whatever rights. I actually think that feminism is a human right. Therefore, based on my definition, yes, I'm a feminist. Yeah, okay. Um, but also, me, I'm a, bit, um, I be, I'm a bit confused because of what I read and see this is on social media. And um, what, I, what, I, what I notice is that the, the young generation are probably look, looking at it like you have to, you have to like struggle with men or well, let, me, let me use the right word. You have to um like like you're equal, you're equal be a man hitter. hitter yes be a man hitter yeah you know i i and that means that i was when some of them said i spoke to some of them they said to me that i know that it's like i don't have to make it now so they don't misquote me now you know like <laughs> it's it's true this true and because they, they just read me into things a lot you know? <laughs> so like um that thing about that, that submissiveness that we're taught, you know, mm-hmm. um, like being submissive to your husband, it's, it's changing. Like, if the man says, hey, you can give him bass goes, bass goes straight. 
So I, and I also think that a lot of them have different meaning to feminism. For, um, to, um, feminism, you know, I don't think the, the what it really means is what they are actually some of them are practicing. You know? Correct. So, Correct. You are one. You be, I mean, like you just explained to me what you what you feel about what you think feminism is, and you're married. You have your children. Your husband is supportive of you. Every time I see you and your husband, I know you guys very well. I know you're not acting to be a happy woman or you're in a wonderful marriage. Your husband is one supportive, different man. So the bass goes that, you know, I don't know. I just think there's something we need to let these ladies know that. I mean, men will always be men, you know, but I'm not saying that I'm not, I mean, I can't even take crap. As long as the man does not disrespect you, you still have to know that there's a man in the house. I don't know. I don't even know that I'm even explaining it right for them to understand, but I just feel that the men still needs to be respected, you know. But, but, the but who have to also respect the woman, mm. yeah. Mm. So, yes. so, what are, so I mean, what what is the right? What is our right really? Is it that because we, I mean, what is our what is our right as women? I really, I really want to know. What do you think our right is as as um. Uh, as, as, women. as as women, as women, as right. women, right? And and Azuka, you make such a good point. Before I go into into the response, and the first good point you make is that feminism is not man hating. I'm not sure where people get all that idea about feminism being man hating. Friends, manly and man hating. We have brothers and we have children that are boys. So I don't believe that feminism is man hating in any way. Feminism for me, as I said earlier, is equity. And it's equity in remuneration. Why should a man and a woman do the same work, have sometimes the same or even better output, and then they earn differently? Why? Mm. Why should a, yeah. a, a male sporting, a male rugby or football um, 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 team get better sponsorship than the female? Look, I believe that what is good for the geese is good for the gander. Mm -hmm. And we can put that aside. Having said that, look, the minimum currency in any relationship is respect. Respect, and yeah. And the woman, yeah. and it's mutual respect. I beg your mm -hmm. pardon, let me qualify it. It's mutual respect. So it's a woman mm -hmm. respecting the man, and it's a man respecting the woman. So it, it's not lopsided. And I believe that the reason it's been lopsided in a lot of ways is because of patriarchy. And obviously... Patriarchy has been there for many, 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 many generations. So obviously something that will keep fighting. But I'm glad to know that, I mean, we're getting places. Well, yeah, but for me, even this one was saying that equality with, between men, I still want my, I still want the man to pay the bills, though. At least, the, at least, I, not like I will not pay, because I don't, that's, <laughs> pay your, you are the man, pay your bills. Doesn't mean I'm not going to practice what I, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching, because now, so because I'm saying that, oh, the women want equal, equal right with us, that means that they have to start sharing bills with us, like share everything. But my, with us my so. son, my son says so. My sons cannot understand why we shout equity, and when it comes to bills, we want to be treated differently. My my um, younger son gave me an illustration, and he said um, somebody, a girl, abused him, and he he spoke back at her, and and she said, "But that's not fair." So his their point, and in this generation, yeah. next, 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 they feel like. If you say it's equal, then it should be equal in everything. Yeah. Okay. Because um, let me not let me not let me go to my personal life. Let me jump to the next question. <laughs> <laughs> what is, it, what is that, be a man and catch the bills? Yeah, be a man and catch the bills and still respect me. Though. Be a man, catch the bills and still respect me. That's just it. Okay. Now, in Kiru, um, there's so many. I mean, like, you know, every time on Instagram or social media, we see women supporting women. Me, personally, I'm beginning to think that that, that thing is a scam. <laughs> it's a scam. Oh. Women supporting women is a scam. You know, I, I mean, I see it all the time. The people that are, the advocates of it on social media, they're not doing it one-on-one. -on -one. They're, doing, they're not doing it. They're not practicalizing what they're preaching. So they're not deceiving. They're just, I don't want to call names. I don't want to call names, but I but, we, but you know that we are like I can talk about it later. But the thing is that I think it's a scam. Women supporting women is a scam. So what is your view about that? I mean it, it's I mean it's something that I I talk about often. Ah, Rita, Rita, you're doing, doing 
Rita, you are doing sorry. You are, Rita, you are doing power. Women supporting yes. women. I think Rita, I think it's a scam. This one. Rita says girl power. Can Somebody says Rita says no, but Rita says you are very right, Azuka. Yes. Oh, okay. I thought she was supporting. Like she's saying that. Um... Right. So I mean, I've had great experiences of female support. Um, one of the leaders that I thrived under. Um, thrived, got promoted, blah, 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 was a female. And one of the leaders that I've learned a lot from is a female. So women actually do support women. And you would find that, I mean, even in the business sphere, people will testify of having gotten support. Now, let me put that aside. In the times where you find women not supporting women, it's women have the great ability to be catty the great ability to be unkind. And when you find women who are dealing with that unkindness and are not being, are not being helpful or supportive, you will find that they have personal issues that, that they're dealing with in their personal life. So, I mean, I've learned to discount it. In those days, my husband would say to me, eh, but you know that's how women are now. You don't agree. And I'll fight, fight, fight. Don't say that. We agree. We support each other. Now, I don't fight him as much because I've seen some really tough cases. So I've, I've, I've seen tough cases. But that said, when you find women that are supportive, they really are. When you find women that are catty, oh my God, they're going to crush you. So we're on two opposite extremes. When yeah. we support, we support really well. Yeah. And I mean, I saw an African proverb that says, actually, on a bus, um, a, a, you know those yellow bosses behind it. They said, "After God, fear woman," because when a woman supports you, she sits, I've, I've seen it before. Yes, yeah, she sits powerfully behind you. Mm -hmm. In the same vein, when she doesn't support you, Azuka, I, I suggest that you run away from the face of the earth because she'll probably kill you if anything. <laughs> yeah, but somebody just said on the comment section that female bosses can frustrate you, <laughs> like they can frustrate the life out of you. You know, and that um, that is a no go area with female orgas and everything. You know, well, you know, I can I can talk about my experience. My experience, you know, recently, two of my former boss, um, two, um, my editor, my started editor, Jemamu Gugu and Ruto Sime, they were recognized as one of the powerful men on, um, in Africa when it comes to journalism. You know, and I've worked with both of them, and. Um, then I was that was my rookie years as a young girl, and when when they were drain, when they were when they were when they were like giving me what to do, really? and I was yeah when they were training me, and you know that thing that oh you want to go out with your friends and they'll not call you that you have to go for this assignment. I thought I thought they actually didn't like me because they were the workload was so much on me, and and the good thing is that I didn't even know I was performing. I was actually performing, and they knew I was performing. And the moment I slow down, they come, they, like, they, like they breathe down my neck. You know, so initially I used to think that they didn't like me. But, but, you know, hindsight, looking at everything today, I think they trained me. I think they trained me for good because I can right now stand on my, on my feet on my own because if I remember some of the things they did to me. Even my staff right now at Media Room Hub, I said, look, people are enjoying. Those days... <laughs> I used, to, I used to like cover like seven events in a day. In Kiru, I must go to all these events in a day and I must do my reports. I thought they were like, they were choking me with work, you know, but, but today I'm grateful to those women, to Miss mm. Ijeman Hudu and Miss Rutosime, and I love them. I really love them, honestly. They really, now that I'm older, now that I'm, I'm my own boss, and I see that these women meant well. So I don't know if... Um, you know, because um, why I'm going, why I'm going back to this is that when I, when I, when that happened, or I've seen girls, ladies say that, like now this comment section, that women bosses are terrible. So I want to know, is it that when your boss give you an assignment and you don't deliver, and they attack you, I don't even know, including in, in yoga now. You know what I'm talking about? You yoga, <laughs> you did yeah, up, up there. So look, I think, I think this is the experience. Look, I think, I think Zuki, I think that women have an unfair expectations of other women. 
Mm. And they don't have the yeah. same expectation of, of male bosses. Yeah. So if I ask you to do something for me, like you, like you were talking about your former bosses, um, I will expect them not to expect of me to submit the report because we are both women and I'm tired anyway. But if it was a male boss, I would be in a hurry. I would say, let me submit the report so he's not going to be able to take it. He will be upset. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I think it's, it's not fair for women. If we're discussing equity, then we should have equity in both ways. Um, and therefore, my, my point is, is really about women having the right expectations of a female boss. A female boss should treat you professionally. A female boss yeah. should ask you to deliver very, your work. Very. A female very boss very should very. penalize you if you don't deliver on your work. And so should the male boss. So I don't think that it's fair that it's easier for us to quickly give um, the male, the female boss, the male boss a free pass and then the female boss um, a red card because we think female bosses should treat us differently. I'm not from that school. Anyone who's worked with me knows that I can be very professional. You yeah. must do your work. I mean, I remember having, I would have um, challenges with you at work. I'll get you to do the work. We may even you know, not be on terms. And if tomorrow morning, Saturday morning, you're having your, your baby's nanny ceremony or whatever you're doing, baby's party. I'll be the first to be in your house because I think that women should learn to compartmentalize. And that's where men tend to thrive more because mm -hmm. they don't take things as personal as we do. They're not as emotional about yeah, work. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they're not. Yeah, they're, they're not. not. You're right. Because even, they're because not. I remember very well, even then on the side decks, she also has, like she also gives the male, I mean the my colleagues gives them work to do. But they 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 get out of their own their own their own um situation faster than me. I'll still be there like talking, angry, but the, the guys have moved on. You won't even know that she's shouted at everybody. You know, you're right. I think the men the men don't they're not like us that are emotional. You know, women are you know how it is now. Now I'm going to surgery like the new thing right now <laughs> everybody wants to have the ah uh, shape body because you, you know you know you know, you know how i used to look that time like you know i was hot those days it's ah. like fat took over <laughs> <laughs> so madam fat took over my my pent house it's not it's not but it's only one part of the hips only one side that it came to only one side but carry on your, your stomach is big I mean, people have told me that ah, you can if you, you just you are talking, you snatch your stomach away, just snatch it a bit, mm. then your body will just come out. So what is of you about mm. this new thing about um, liposuction and even people are dying and people are still doing it? Mm. You know, what do you think about mm. about that? Because I love my, I, I've added weight though, but I still like my rubber body, and I always say to myself that <laughs> nobody can body shame you, nobody can body shame. You. <laughs> I'll try and lose weight, but I'm not going to stress myself. What's what's the view about people not being patient, like to, mm. like go to the gym and they think of the fastest way is for them to go mm -hmm. under the surgeon's knife, and some of them don't come out alive or they come out with the botched uh, body or something, you know? Mm. Look, I think that the first thing is to acknowledge that everyone who's an adult over 18 has um the license to take decisions over his or her body. So your body is your right. I think that's the first rule to establish. I think the second principle is some people do this out of health reasons. Um, my cousin was very busty. One of my cousins, very, very busty and suffered from backache for many years. I have no idea that being busty could afford you that amount of backache. And she had the surgery to to resize her boobs. And you know, the quality of her life improved. Her back was better and you know, she's better and she also looks lean. She's also happier and lighter. So that's so the one piece. But I think the, the for most fundamental thing is the way that we raise our daughters. Yeah. And we must raise our daughters with great confidence. Look, Zuki, you're seeing me. As old as I am, I'm a size 12. If you push me, I can enter a size 10 dress. I know. When I was younger, in fact, for so long, somebody who was my roommate was reminding me that when I was in Virgin Atlantic, I could buy T-shirts for 13 and 14 year olds. I've always been skinny, but you couldn't tell me anything. 
You couldn't, I didn't care whether you were Naomi Campbell or you couldn't tell me anything because I felt like I had an oversupply of confidence. Therefore, it didn't matter whether I was skinny or it didn't even, it didn't even occur to me. So, so the point I'm making is we've got to raise our children to be confident in their bodies and in themselves because it is these insecurities that force us, you know, sometimes under the knife that force us, you know, onto strange things. And like you say, mm -hmm. many people haven't been waking up from the anesthesia. People are passing on. Now, if you passed on for a major surgery, that's okay. But if you pass on for something that maybe confidence could have built or just, just self-love could have helped you, I think that is a bit, is a bit tricky. But otherwise, raise your children with great confidence in their bodies. It's so important. Doesn't matter whether you are horrible or lekma or your middle. You just have to love yourself and your body. You should love yourself. Ladies, can you hear her? Love yourself. Confidence in yourself. I mean, like, <laughs> don't even allow anybody to body shame you. That's what the, because the body shaming thing is the, is what I think also leads yeah, to that is. that. Um, when you become insecure of yourself, you're not, um, you know. So, anyway, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are rolling. Kiru, um, lately, we were talking about, um, well, I mean, it was coronavirus, then George was killed in America by this police officer who strangled him. Then the next thing you're seeing on our social media platform is rape, rape, rape. Like, it's like rape is just like an epidemic right now. Now, I'm, I know you're a mother of two boys, two cute boys. Um, I'm just thinking, I actually wrote this question and I don't want to forget how I want to put it across to you. As a mother of boys, do you feel, um, do you feel, I mean, like, do you spend time discussing, um, like, like, rape with them and, you know, and um, how to treat women right? Do you spend time with them? Because rape is just on our ears, in our sleep now, it's in our head. I mean, like, is it like, is it like it's getting worse? What is really happening? Is it, I don't know. It's, um, it's scary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think, Mother? Should I mean, I think first, I mean, hmm. yeah. I mean, I think first, I'm happy that um, it's not as, it's not as, um, a paria, a subject, as it was in those days. Um, so I'm so glad. I'm glad that people are, are speaking up more confidently and more, people are not being as victimized as, as they were previously. So I'm so happy that that is, is coming to light. Um, I mean, with my boys, we talked about it yesterday. We talk about it all the time. I'm in the kitchen, they're in the kitchen with me, we're talking about rape, and I think he's not just talking to them about it, he's listening to what they're saying, because it's important to me that I get feedback, and, you know, I listen to them, I listen to what they're saying, and, you know, I keep saying, why in a tricky time? Why in a tricky time for the young boys? And I feel like there's a lot more that should be done for the young boys. I know that a lot of us are concentrating on the females, but the boys need a lot of attention and they need a lot of attention to reorientate them. Um, so the ones who are impressed by toxic mas masculinity, where being a male is all about strength, forcing people, getting people to do what you want them to do. So They're they need reorientation. Yes. Very aggressive they need reorientation. Yeah. Correct. They need um, um, they, they, they need to be told what the right type of conversations to have in the barber's shop, in quotes, because it is in those barber's shops that people pick up things and you hear loose and really careless, you know, valueless statements. And, and I feel like with reorientation, constant conversations, teaching the right values, I feel like we'll begin to, oh, no, 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 that's too easy. And obviously... Um, following through on whatever penalties it is that has been put in place for when um, people have been um, found to have committed a crime of rape. I feel like that would begin to change the conversation. So 
We talk to our boys all the time about it. And Azuka, you will be shocked to know what they have to say. That's your sons? Yes. How old is the first son right now? 15. 15, wow. 15 turning 16. He's turning 16. Second... Actually, he's turning 16 this month. Then the second one is, uh, the second one should be like... 12 uh, turning 13. Oh, okay. So I'm like, okay, when you spend time in the kitchen with them, just do you also teach them how to cook and tell them that, look, do you know that sometimes you might marry a busy woman and you are home? Do you teach, I mean, like, do you discuss about how they have to help their wives at home in case in the future they finally get married? Mm. Oh, yes, they do. And I think that my children moving here in a lot of ways has provided them a lot more exposure. They're in a mixed school. And I have to tell you that the young girls in those schools are, I don't know what brand of feminism, but they're really not having it. And so the boys, <laughs> yes, 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 yes. So the boys already know that they're in a tough world. Wow. And the girls are, you know, they're, they're just more demanding, more assertive, and just more, you know, frontal. So they know. So, I mean, sometimes I joke, I'm like, come and learn how to cook, because as you can see from the girls in your class, nobody's about to cook for you. So I suggest you come and help yourself and learn how to cook. So I think that equity, and, and it's interesting, even my children are picking up prejudice. When I, I made a statement the other day, um, my younger one came and told me that somebody doing a Zoom class, somebody put a hamster in the camera. So I said, how can somebody put a hamster in the camera, naughty boy? My son said, why do you think he's a boy? Why didn't you say naughty girl? Why, why, why did you say? And then I started laughing. So we do this thing where they are the, the male fighters and then I'm the female fighter. So that's where we are in our household. Okay, um, but the, okay, whenever you discuss the rape thing with them, do you also discuss the consequences of? Oh, yes. I mean, like, yes. The, yes. Um, the consequence, like, okay, fine. Okay, um, growing up, okay, I, I need to read this out now because I wrote it very long. Growing up as an undergraduate at Unilag, rape was a big word. Do you think rape has always been with us and we just didn't speak about, about it or do you think we, uh, we now have an epidemic? I mean, you know, during our time, so a lot of people must have been, you know. Hmm. Did you get my question? So rape, has, rape has always been with us, Zuki, always. I think the fact that we were shaming the victims for many years refrained people from, from speaking up. And I dare you to speak to at least 10 of your friends. Out of 10, you'll find one or two who have had near rape incidences or direct rape incidences. And they've kept it all these years and not spoken up. So rape has been with us for a long time, but obviously social media makes us amplifies it, and we can hear it, you know, a lot more. The young lady, bless her soul, who got raped in Ibadan. We couldn't have heard it as much if there was no social media, or if okay, there was a girl in, a girl in, uh, in Benin, Uwa. Uwa. So social media has helped us amplify it, and for that, we are so thankful, so thankful. Otherwise, all the stories will have come to light. Okay, now, I also... Also on social media, some of the guys that have come out, I mean, like they probably appear like rape apologists. They said that why do we, why do women come around them dressing sexily and and dressing like to seduce them? Now, what do they expect? So does it you mean know, that? Azuka, every time I what? hear, I didn't even let you finish the statement because every mm -hmm. time I hear it, it riles me up. So yeah. the point you are making is every woman who wears a strapless dress, you must rape. Mm -hmm. That means that you have a mental problem. And, and the truth is, even people in full hijabs covered from head to toe have been raped. So what like then is the excuse? The girl, um, Rahabat, or I think Rahabat, yeah, she, yeah, Rahabat. she was a Muslim, Rabbi, yeah, she's a Muslim girl covered, you know. So, so the principles, because every time I'm lost, I go to use principles. And the first principle is that sex is consensual. If somebody says no, it's no. If somebody says yes and suddenly says no, it's still no. If somebody says maybe, that is no. 
So until they say yes to you, it is no. And then the second thing is self-control and self-discipline as a man. You cannot hold the next person responsible for your own lack of self-control. So mm. that's why I'm saying to myself, there needs to be a lot of education. Obviously with the men, because they are the perpetrators, but also with the women as well. And I was thinking about a song that I can't even believe that that song was in existence. And I have to ask the Lord to have mercy on me if I ever sang it without knowing. Do you know one song called when you touch her hand, she will say, don't touch. When you touch her leg, she will say, don't touch. When you touch her bum, she will pretend not to know. That song is a problem. That wow. song is a problem. It's those songs that show the chauvinism, the patriarchy, and everything that is wrong with our society. And, and I'm saying both ways because the men were taught that resistance is part of the whole cutting a lady show, and that if she says no, she doesn't really mean no. Now with our girls, I think that if I had a daughter, I would tell, say to her, if you want, say that you want. If you don't want, say you don't want. And be and upfront. Don't, and don't because, go near the person. You don't want. Don't, no. don't even go out going there. Because I, mean, I like, find that is this woman. I mean, look, there's a, and, and I was going to post something a few days ago, and my husband said, well, maybe you shouldn't. There's a guy who who's, was my friend in school. He was actually my friend's friend because they read law together. And his name is Dele. He will come to our house. We'll all read. We'll all read. We'll all eat. And we'll all sleep. And in the morning, he will go. So when I started reading this whole rape thing, I said to myself, well, this is how the rape occurs. Because what it means is that in the night, the person wakes up and becomes a rapist. Because at the time, it's people you know, people you're associated with and all. So, so the point is, people need to be taught personal discipline. Someone cannot be responsible for your own indiscipline. You cannot make me a victim of your lack of self-control. It can be. It's terrible. So, so now, like, I'm, I'm thinking right now because some of them, like, some of them say that it wasn't like that the girls give them green light because we have to also look at the women too. The women, the, the women, that the, I remember one story that um, one story that happened one time like that, and the lady later said that she was hurt because the guy enticed her. I mean, the guy made her feel feel that he wanted to date her. But after the guy had his way like once, twice, the guy stopped taking her calls. He stopped. Um, he doesn't talk to her anymore, you know. So out of anger, she just went on Twitter and tweeted that the guy raped her. So we have to also look at that part where the women too gets vindictive because probably what they wanted did not work out. So how the men, how do you think the men can even escape that aspect? I mean, like, who will listen to them? Because now if a woman comes to say that a man has raped me, we are all after the man. Even me, we've carried our placards. Oh, you raped, you raped, you raped, or whatever. So how do we, because we are not, because when they come out and say they raped them, we're not there. We're just listening to what they, what they have to say. Because she, listen, and I said to her that, why would you, I mean, like, I said to her that, me too, I've had a whereby I was hot, but I didn't even think of wanting to go and say the guy raped me or whatever, you know? So what do you have to say about that aspect too? Because you have to also look at that aspect too. Yes, yes. And, and Azuka, you are right, because I think it was recently I saw a video of somebody that had been incarcerated for nearly 30 years for a false rape accusation. I mean, I think that that is terrible. Mm -hmm. I feel like you've killed someone because 30 years is somebody's whole life. After 30 mm -hmm. years, he's yeah. lived the better part of his life. So there's that piece where people throw the word around. Some people may throw the word around rape carelessly, like you say, to be vindictive and all. I feel like if those people are also caught, they should be penalized. Because if the tables were turned, the guy will be penalized. And if we say we're fighting equity, then what is good for the geese is good for the gender. So if you take somebody's life and take somebody's time with false accusation, then I think that you need to be penalized. Because it's a serious accusation. 
My children say that people should be giving consent forms and that when you walk into the house and you say you want to drink wine and sleep overnight, that they'll give you a consent form and they'll say, oh yeah, Azuka sign that you said yes, you stay it's here. Yes, it's going to get to that stage. And it's going to get to that stage, yeah. Oh. I think so. When my son said this to me, I was like, me? He said, yeah. he said, Mama, they will sign consent for me. We are not laughing because if they say I raped them, what is what am I? What will you say? What did Trevor Noah said something? He said I watched a clip of his or listened, and he said a friend of his came to the house and they were drinking, and as they were drinking, things were getting nice and they were laughing. And he said, you know what? He tapped her. He said, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, obviously this is my Nigerian voice, but he tapped her and said, come and go. It's okay, come and be going. And she said, can't friends just stay together again? Why are you saying? He said, we can't stay together because you are my friend. We drink. If you sleep now and I sleep, it was if you wake up in the morning and say, I raped you. Who do I want to say? Oh, yeah, 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 come and go. So it's going to be a dramatic world moving forward. It's going to be. It's definitely going to be. Because, I, because I, I, had a, I was talking to one of my friends, you know, one of my very good friends. That was yesterday. Because we saw some allegations on some celebrities on social media that have raped girls who have come out to say they were raped. And we're talking. And um, because we're not saying where nobody was there, but from the evidences coming out, turning out, you know, like some of like one of the celebrities did a tweet about seven years ago. He tweeted about rape, like he was supporting rape and whatnot, and you know. So after seven years, the thing is coming back to slap him on his face. A girl has come out to say that he, he actually raped her because in the tweet he was encouraging rape. I mean, Kiri, you need to see that. I'm going to send it to you on WhatsApp after this. Make you, make, you, make you go read them. I said, I said, may we not use our hand? Maybe he did that thing out of youthful exuberance. You know, when they, are, when they drink, they're high, they just misbehave and they think, oh, social media is just for them to go me writing nonsense. Not knowing that everything you write on social media or you do is waiting for you. It's waiting. It's waiting for you. Waiting. Another five, six years. It's come and give you one better slap. One. One bus goes that you don't even know how to, you not you might think that somebody in your place read bus goes, bus, bus goes. You know, I say, Oh, my blade people are chasing me. So we have to be very careful about what we say on social media, what we do, you know, everything like, oh, I'm 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 having fun. Sometimes those that fun might lead to your downfall, another 10, 20 years to come. So I'm what I'm trying to hear to say is that you just said something about what your son said that um consent or no consent form. Now, let me use myself as an example. I told you earlier on today, you know, a lot of times I travel because of my job. I travel out of the country, go for assignments, events. Then I had this friend. We're very close. The male friend, my colleague. Well, my paddy, as in my real paddy, like, there's no I don't discuss with him. I have a new boyfriend or anything I tell, anything I tell him. So when on this trip to, to Paris, to south of France, and because of we got there late, we missed accommodation. So we had to uh, share rooms. Because I, I see them as my brother. I know their wives. I know that, you know, so I'm like, okay, it's we we. Because when you're when you're on the field, when you're in the field, you don't you don't see yourself as a woman anymore. You're you're looking for story. You're just looking at it as a, like a, a media soldier, you know. So when we went on the street. And we, I ended up, I ended up in the room with these guys. We were all on the same, in the same room, the same bed. Uh, midway at night, something was just tricking me. It's not I'm like, it's not, not, but something was just pricking me, pricking me. I'm like, ah. you know, in my sleep, I just turned, and I didn't even turn. I just said, let me see what is doing pricking me behind. You know, I now heard the thing. It was, it was my friends. I don't know much whether I use the word D on but my friend Don Thomas, you know, pricking him. I'm like, uh-uh. Now I was not too sure which of them. But I was I, I did it in my I mean I held it in my sleep. So I just squeezed the squeeze this thing there. Eh? It's, it's Bola, they call it Bola. Let me call it it. Bola. I squeezed his Bola, you know, with all my strength. He just screamed. And the other guy woke up and jumped up from the bed. So, uh uh, it was like, I said, You want to rape me? Eh, you. I don't call his name because he has apologized to me and 
I don't think I need to drag him into this. I'm just telling you, I'm just going to say, like, sometimes this rape thing is not even about whether you wear short thing or you wear whatever. It's not about it. It's just, I don't know, it's just last, last, it's just self control. So I held this thing, and the other guy was begging Azuka, please, because it was really, it was nice. Like, the guy was really crying or almost crying or whatever. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, how can you of all people want to, want to do this to me? So when the other guy, because I'm very, I can be stubborn. So the other guy ran out of the room. I went to call our other colleagues that were in the next room, you know, and they came and they all started begging me. So I was the only, I was the only woman in their midst. They were, they were four guys. I was the only woman in their midst. So they all begging me. I said, eh, you know, we used to be, me and the guy used to be very close. That strained our relationship. But after that uh, experience in France, we stopped, um, we stopped communicating. He has called me like once or twice, you know, but we used to talk like almost every day. You know, what I, what I never got to ask him was because I was so hot, because I trusted him so much. He was like my, you know, when someone is your paddy, your, your G, yeah. and that happened, you know. Yes, but I've not been able to face him because I'm still in shock of what happened in Paris. I've not been able to face him and ask him, like, why did you do that? What happened, you know? Because I, I, can, I can tell you he's a nice guy, he's a nice person. I'm not going to say because of what happened, I'm going to condemn him, but... I need to ask him that why did you do what you do? What why did you do what you did to me in Paris? You know, I thought you we were I thought we were blood, I thought we were family. You know, even if I thought I thought also that if I if I go if I strip naked, this guy will not his thing will not raise. In thing go tanda, you know, go tanda. You know, so in Guru serious, that was how, that was how I saw him honestly. You know, so I, I never ever I didn't think his thing will ever you know, he will ever think about me that to that direction. You know, so I was actually hurt. And I was in shock for a very long time. In short, that even distracted me in, in Paris. I didn't what I didn't do. I couldn't even the shock. The, the shock, eh? In Kirue, I was like, no, no, because I, I respected this guy so much and I liked him like like a brother. So in his case now, because I, and he's very intelligent. We, we also say that he was he has a mental problem. Or he's just wanted to just try his, you know, some of them they just want to try their luck and say, okay, let this get this girl, let me just try my luck. You know, we can't, we can't keep on saying that they have mental issues. Sometimes I think they want to just see how loose you are. Or I don't even know. I mean, I, 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 you cannot even place this rip thing. You cannot, you can't, even, you can, like, just like mental illness. You cannot even, you can't even, you can't even explain how it starts. What causes it? Just like this rip thing. So in his case now, how would you? I mean, what would you think it was? Did I, I mean, maybe unconsciously I was showing some, some signs that, that I didn't, I mean, what could it be? Look, Azuka, in the real world, people should ask, do you want to have sex? You say, no, I don't want to have sex. Or you say, God forbid, how can you ask me if I want to have sex? I'm your colleague. Then everybody's clear. But it's back to that cultural thing of saying, maybe, maybe, maybe she wants, but she doesn't want to say or just let me try my luck because you know normally women are not up front let me just try my luck they might want but except you push it's nonsense and then ultimately it's the self-control because this if you, you have personal discipline you will stop and ask since that's the thing that you want and say is it okay if we have sex and then let azuka go crazy saying how bloody dare you ask me god punish you what if you call the hotels come and arrest him the police they will cancel his uh, um